IB Bio, Genetics Part 3, will have its focus on two heredity patterns, codominance and multiple alleles. The essential idea is the inheritance of genes follows patterns. Here is the outline of the movies available for the genetics unit. Use this slide to find the movie you need for the review of material. This movie is focused here. Codominance is a heredity pattern in which both alleles, when present in the heterozygote, contribute to the phenotype. Codominance is a pattern following one gene with two alleles and the possibility of three phenotypes. Pay close attention with this example. A red female cow is mated to a white male bull, and I've given the genotypes of the parents here and here. These parents have offspring with a color called roan. All of the offspring of these two parents would be roan. The intermediate color comes from some hairs being red while other hairs are white. Both alleles in the heterozygote are contributing to the heterozygote phenotype, roan. Once again, one gene for coat color, two alleles, CR and CW, but three phenotypes, red, white, and roan. Let's look at another example following a gene for the characteristic of flower color. A homozygous red flower plant is crossed with a homozygous white flower plant. You can see the genotypes that I've given. Maybe you can predict the outcome. Notice that the symbols are different than for the dominant recessive heredity pattern. In codominance, with both alleles contributing in the heterozygote, we use a superscript instead of capital and lowercase symbols. The use of the superscript removes the implication that one allele would mask the presence of the other, as in the dominant recessive heredity pattern. Here is the same cross as in the previous slide, but I'm using a Punnett square to show the results. I have the homozygous red flower crossed with the homozygous white flower, and all the offspring have the heterozygous heterozygous genotype, but all the offspring have a pink phenotype. So here's a relevant IB syllabus statement. Predict the genotypic and phenotypic ratios of offspring of monohybrid crosses involving codominance. Note, and this is important, a monohybrid cross is a mating between two individuals who have different alleles at one genetic locus of interest. This is the monohybrid cross it's a cross of two individuals, both heterozygous, both with different alleles at one genetic locus. In the next slide, we'll look at a monohybrid cross involving codominance as the heredity pattern. Here's the monohybrid cross. Both of the individuals are heterozygous, and with codominance as the heredity pattern, both heterozygous parents are phenotypically pink. Their offspring are shown here with the Punnett square. The phenotypic ratio is one red, two pinks, and one white. I'll leave the genotypic ratio to you. With these two IB syllabus statements, both relevant to codominance, let me shift the emphasis to the genetics of known diseases. State that many genetic diseases in humans are due to recessive alleles of autosomal genes, although some genetic diseases are due to dominant or codominant alleles. State that codominant alleles have joint effects. This latter statement should feel familiar to you. Sickle cell anemia is a disease resulting from a mutation to the gene for hemoglobin. Sickle cell displays a codominant heredity pattern because the heterozygote has a phenotype where both alleles play a role. Let me explain. Someone with the genotype HBA, HBA has normal hemoglobin. Someone with the genotype sickle cell, HBS, HBS, suffers from sickle cell anemia. Someone with the HBA, HBS genotype does not have sickle cell, which makes the heredity pattern appear to be dominant recessive, except that the heterozygote individual, by virtue of both alleles, has some resistance to the malarial parasite. The genotype, HBA, HBA, does not have this resistance. Thus, the homozygous, HBA, HBA, and the heterozygous, HBA, HBS, phenotypes are different. 
The individual with the HBA, HBS genotype is a carrier of the sickle cell allele, but does not express sickle cell and is resistant to malaria, unlike HBA, HBA. Interestingly, the sickle cell allele is deleterious, negative, and causes harm to the individuals who are homozygous sickle cell. Many of these individuals do not live to reproduce. As a result, we might expect that the allele would disappear in the population over time due to negative selection pressure. However, due to the malarial resistance provided in the heterozygous condition, the allele is maintained, if not favored in the population, in locations where there is malaria. Thus, it is not surprising that a map showing the incidence of malaria would coincide with a map showing the incidence of sickle cell. The sickle cell story is an interesting story from the perspective of natural selection. In regions with malaria, both the HBA-HBA and HBS-HBS genotypes suffer. Those with normal hemoglobin suffer from malaria as the malarial parasite reproduces within red blood cells and normal hemoglobin does nothing to deter that. Those homozygous for sickle cell suffer from sickle cell anemia and may not live a full life. But those that are heterozygous do not experience sickle cell anemia and have some resistance to malaria. Thus, both alleles, by virtue of heterozygous selection, are maintained in the population. Here's an image showing sickled red blood cells. If you're homozygous for sickle cell anemia, you have many sickled cells and they obstruct capillaries and restrict blood flow to organs. However, if you're heterozygous in a malarial environment with the malarial parasite reproducing within red blood cells, the mixture, the heterozygous mixture of normal and sickle cell hemoglobin molecules reduces malarial success. The heterozygous genotype is favored in a malarial environment. Heterozygote selection is sometimes called balanced polymorphism. Polymorphism because the two alleles each result in a different trait. Polymorph, morph meaning body. The term balanced is used because the two alleles are maintained by selection for the heterozygote over time. If you have studied evolution in this course, this terminology should feel familiar. If you haven't studied evolution, listen carefully here. So let's uh, try to solve a problem with the codominance heredity pattern. Sophia, whose mother had sickle cell, so let's put Sophia's mother right here. Sophia's mother had sickle cell. We don't really know anything about Sophia's father. And Sophia does not suffer from sickle cell. That must mean that Sophia has the A allele for normal hemoglobin, but because her mother did suffer sickle cell, Sophia is actually heterozygous. Now, John, John has no known family history, does not suffer the disease, so John must be homozygous for normal sickle cell. And the question is, what are the uh, expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios of their children? We can put... Uh, Sophia's gametes right here, and we can put John's gametes uh, right here, and I will let you go forward to solve the rest of the problem to determine the phenotypic and genotypic ratios of their children. You can turn the movie off now, or follow along with me. With the Punnett square, we can see the expected ratios for the children of Sophia and John. The phenotypic ratio would be two individuals who are susceptible to malaria, here and here, and two individuals who are resistant to malaria, here and here. The genotypic ratio would be two individuals who have the homozygous normal hemoglobin genotype and two individuals who are heterozygous. Both of these individuals carry the allele for sickle cell even though they don't express sickle cell. Let's move on to a new heredity pattern known as multiple alleles. Multiple alleles is defined as having more than two alleles for one gene at a single locus. The three alleles or more would exist among individuals in a population because any one individual has only two alleles for a gene. 
Now, the ABO blood types would be an appropriate example of multiple alleles. We can see three chromosomes, each displaying a different allele for blood type at the exact same locus. Now, remember, any one individual has only two alleles. So the three alleles, or more in a different example, would exist in the population at large. Again, any one person has only two. These two, or these two, or these two, etc. Pay close attention, there are six possible genotypes. Here's the relevant IB syllabus statement. State that some genes have more than two alleles. Describe genes which have multiple alleles and provide an example in humans. The ABO blood groups is an example of multiple alleles. But let's take a look at the second statement. Note that the ABO blood groups provide an example of multiple alleles, codominance, and the dominant recessive heredity pattern. Pay close attention. Let's take a look. With a closer look at the ABO blood groups, we can see three alleles, that's multiple alleles, and the symbols indicate codominance and dominant recessive, dominant recessive. In other words, three alleles, multiple alleles, and the A allele is codominant with the B allele, but the A is dominant to the O allele, and the B is also dominant to the O allele. There are six possible genotypes here, and the phenotypes are given here. It's important to spend a bit of time with this slide, study this slide before moving forward. Here's a relevant IB syllabus statement that frames the problems that I will present on the slides to come. Predict the genotypic and phenotypic ratios of offspring of monohybrid crosses involving multiple alleles. Here's a problem to solve with the ABO blood groups. We have a type A mother mating a type B father, and they have children, one quarter of whom are type A, one quarter type B, one quarter AB, and one quarter O. Well, immediately we know if they have type O children that they have to be heterozygous. They each have to carry the O allele in order to have children who are type O. Also note that this is a monohybrid cross. Both parents must be heterozygous. And that is given, and that's a hint, as to the genotypes of these two parents. We can fill in the rest of this Punnett square. We have the mother here and her gametes, and we have the father's gametes here, and we're going to have your AB children here, we're going to have your B children here, you're going to have one quarter A children here, and one quarter O children here. Here's another opportunity to practice uh, multiple alleles uh, using the ABO blood groups. A and B alleles are both dominant to O. The A and B are co-dominant to each other. We have a type A mother. We don't know the second allele crossed with a type B father. We don't know the second allele. And we're told that they have 10 children, a lot of children, none of whom are type O. So it's quite likely that one or both of them does not have the O allele and half of their children are type A. That, uh, that tells us that the mother is most likely homozygous A. We do not know at this point the second allele of the dad, but if we look to the next sentence, however, one of their sons marries a type O woman. So they have a son who marries a type O woman, and they, as it turn out, turns out, have um, a type O child. So this son, um, must be a heterozygous with the O allele um, as the second allele. That tells us that this father here is also heterozygous. Now we can put the alleles into the gametes here, and we can see we have an A uh, B child, we have an A B child, two, two children. Um, out of four would be type AB. And then on this side, we have the type A children that we were told about in the problem. Half of the children are type A, and so here they are. That must mean that the son is um, type A. Why? Because he can't be AB. None of his children 
would be type O as in this case. He has to be type A and heterozygous type A. We can fill in the uh, rest of the gametes alleles here. This couple over here will have a type A child. We'll have an O child and another uh, type A child. In fact, the son and his wife will have half of their children type A heterozygous and half of their children type O. You can move to the next slide to see the uh, answer to this problem in a clearer way. Spend some time with both this slide and the next one. Here is a cleaner version of the response to this question. Uh, take some time to study this slide. When we study blood types, the issue of blood donation and blood reception comes up. Who is the universal donor and who is the universal recipient? Why can't type A blood be given to a type B person? The answers to these questions are complicated, involve the presence of, of antibodies in the blood, in addition to the membrane-bound glycoproteins on the red blood cells that define our blood group genotypes. Antibodies will bind and agglutinate clump red blood cells if the antibody and membrane-bound glycoprotein match. Let's take a look. Type A individuals have antibodies that would bind type B cells. And conversely, type B individuals have antibodies that would bind type A cells. Type O individuals have no membrane-bound glycoproteins, so type O is the universal donor. Its cells won't be clumped by anyone with any antibodies because it does not have the membrane-bound glycoproteins to which those antibodies would bind. Type AB individuals have no antibodies, so AB individuals are universal recipients. They can receive blood from anyone without risk of clumping. They have no antibodies that would clump the cells that are being donated to them. As we head toward the end of this movie, let's look at one bit of detail that involves a mutation such that the mutated allele produces non-functioning protein. When this happens, we have a pattern known as incomplete dominance. And often codominance is lumped with incomplete dominance, even though they are very different. In codominance, both alleles are functioning to produce protein, while in incomplete dominance, one allele is not functioning. By the way, I'm extending here because the IB does not use the term incomplete dominance. Tay-Sox is, is a disease that's an example of a mutation that would cause death to someone homozygous for the allele because the mutated allele produces a non-functioning enzyme. But the heterozygote is a healthy person, just like the homozygous normal person. Thus, we might say that the Tay-Sox allele, the mutated allele, is recessive to the normal allele for the enzyme. But the situation really is different. Upon close examination of a heterozygote cell, we see a phenotype that is intermediate, just like codominance. But in this case, again, we're focused on what's called incomplete dominance. The heterozygote cell is only producing half of the amount of enzyme as the homozygous normal cell. The normal allele is producing protein while the mutated allele is not. Again, on the surface, Tay-Sachs appears to be a case of dominant recessive, as both the homozygous normal and the heterozygous genotype have the same phenotypic expression, a normal life. But at the cell level, the heterozygote carrier is producing only half as much enzyme as the homozygous normal individual. This is called incomplete dominance. As we've been examining the genetics of diseases, diseases that result from DNA mutation, we might as well take a look at the causes of mutation. Here's the IB syllabus statement. Explain how radiation and mutagenic chemicals increase the mutation rate and can cause diseases and cancer. Refer to cyclins, oncogenes, and metastasis. Mention the correlation between smoking and the incidence of cancer. Cyclins are proteins that control cell division, control mitosis, prevent cells from dividing, dividing, dividing in an uncontrolled manner. If the DNA that directs cyclin synthesis becomes mutated, Cell division may no longer be controlled, and cancer would be the result. The radiation from nuclear bombs is mutagenic to oncogenes. 
an oncogene is a gene that has the potential to cause cancer as it is a gene involved in the regulation of cell division. Nuclear power plant accidents produce radiation that is mutagenic to oncogenes. An oncogene is a gene that has the potential to cause cancer as it is a gene involved in the regulation of cell division. Smoking exposes lung tissue to chemicals that are mutagenic to oncogenes. Cyclins are proteins present in high concentrations in the cytoplasm through the cell cycle, particularly during cell division. You can see the concentrations of different cyclin proteins rising and falling through the stages of the cell cycle. The cyclic nature of the concentration change is the origin of the name cyclin. The inference is that cyclins play a role in regulating cell division. Cyclins are not enzymes, but cyclins influence enzymes important in cell division. For example, cyclins influence the initiation of DNA replication and spindle formation. If one of the cyclin genes is mutated, then cell division could continue without stop and the onset of a tumor would occur. Here is some information about tumor formation. Oncogenesis should be reviewed at this point. Oncogenesis as mutations in the gene that control the cell cycle. The genes are called oncogenes. Anything that increases the risk of mutation increases the risk of tumor formation. For example, mutagenic chemicals or radiation. A bit more on oncogenesis. When cell cycle control is lost, the cell undergoes repeated cell divisions that produce a mass of cells known as a tumor. This is a primary tumor, usually benign. The spreading of cancerous cells in the body is known as metastasis or metastasis. The tumors that develop from the spread of cancerous cells are known as secondary tumors. If secondary tumors are not treated, they can lead to death. The mitotic index is the number of cells undergoing mitosis out of the total number of cells counted in a tissue. If a tissue is analyzed and an oncologist determines the index to be high, she will consider the possibility of a tumor in that tissue and recommend further examination. Repeated tests using the mitotic index of the tissue would allow the oncologist to determine how fast the tumor was growing. For example, oncologists might want to assess the effect of chemotherapy. If chemotherapy was effective, the mitotic index would be lower than it had been prior to the therapy. You should be aware that there is a high correlation between the smoking of cigarettes and the incidence of lung cancer. And while we must always be careful not to assume that correlation equals causation, many studies, many studies have implicated specific chemicals in cigarette smoke as mutagens. Thus, scientists have confidence that the correlation seen here represents causation. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio Genetics Part 3. Genetics Part 4 will focus on genes found on the X or Y chromosomes. These are known as sex-linked genes.